Olá, sejam todos bem-vindos, estamos aqui em mais um webinar da FGVDAP. É, primeiro eu vou ler aqui um disclaimer e depois vou apresentar o nosso tema e os nossos convidados. Uh, então, as manifestações expressas por integrantes dos quadros da Fundação de Atulio Vargas e por convidados que participam dos eventos e transmissões online representam exclusivamente as opiniões dos seus autores e não necessariamente a posição institucional da FGV. Reiteramos também que todos aqui presentes concordaram em participar desse evento de forma espontânea e, com isso, autorizam o uso de sua imagem para essa transmissão, que ficará disponível posteriormente nos canais oficiais da FGV. Uh, bom, hoje nós estamos aqui para o webinar Abundância, Pablo Bokowski, Debate Excesso de Informação. Eu sou a Luísa Santos, eu sou doutora em Comunicação e Informação e também pesquisadora da FGV DAP. E para a nossa conversa de hoje estão aqui comigo o professor Pablo Bokowski e também o diretor da FGVDAP, o Marco Rudiger. Vou começar então apresentando os nossos convidados. Pablo Bukowski é professor na Northwestern University, ele é fundador e diretor do Centro é, for Latin Digital Media e diretor acadêmico do mestrado em Leadership for Creative Enterprises, ambos na, Nor na Northwestern, cofundador e co-diretor do Center for Study of Media and Society, na Argentina, uma iniciativa que é conjunta da Northwestern e da Universidade de San Andres, em Buenos Aires. É Senior Fellow no Weisbaum Institute for the Network Society, na Alemanha. Em 2020, ele foi nomeado Fellow na International Community Association. Ele é autor e coautor de seis livros, coeditor de quatro volumes e escreveu mais de 50 artigos científicos. Seus projetos de livros incluem social media atuais, incluem é, Social Media Studies, Comparative Perspectives, em coautoria com Mora Matassi, e uh, The Patina of Distrust, Misinformation in a Contest of Generalized Skepticism, também em coautoria com Eugênia Michelsen, Maria Celeste Wagner e Facundo Suens. E o diretor Marco Alério Rudiger é, diretor, é doutor em Sociologia e mestre em Policy Analysis e Management, Atualmente, ele é diretor aqui da Diretoria de Análise de Políticas Públicas da Fundação Getúlio Vargas, está à frente do projeto de criação da Escola de Comunicação, Mídia e Informação da FGV. Seus campos de interesse são Sociologia Política, Análise de Redes Sociais e a Inovação Tecnológica em seus impactos na, demo na democracia. Membro do Conselho Consultivo da Associação Brasileira de Comunicação Empresarial, a BERG, e do NDI, National Democrat Institute de Washington. Coordena ainda o projeto Digitalization Democracy in Brazil, realizado com o apoio do Ministério das Relações Exteriores da Alemanha, e o projeto The Circulation of Dangerous Speech in 2020 Brazilian Elections, apoiado pelo Facebook com bolsa de licitação internacional. Rudiger também é membro do Conselho Consultivo do Observatório para a Transparência nas Eleições do Tribunal Superior Eleitoral, o TSE, que se concentra na integridade digital das eleições de 2022 no Brasil. Para quem está nos assistindo aqui no Zoom, é, lembrando que vocês podem fazer perguntas aqui pelo Q&A para os nossos é, palestrantes, uh, do, pode ser durante a fala deles e ao final a gente vai ter um momento de perguntas, e também podem ser feitos para quem está nos vendo no YouTube é, pelo aplicativo Slido. Então eu gostaria de começar convidando o professor Pablo Bokowski a fazer a sua fala inicial, seja bem-vindo professor, é um prazer recebê-lo, a palavra está com você. Thank you very much, Luisa. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Amaro, and all the friends at FGV. Truly delighted to be here. I wish I could be in Rio, but uh, you know, because of a pandemic, it, we will have to do this time at least uh, with a webinar format. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Let me know if you have any problem uh, seeing the content. I'm going to put it 
in presentation view. Uh, I'm going to assume that everybody can see this. Uh, and if not, please let me know. Um, before I start, thank you, everybody in the audience. I cannot see you, but I hope you find the presentation interesting and inspiring. And I look forward to your questions. I'm going to talk about uh, one of my uh, new books published this year, Abundance, that came out with Oxford University Press in May of this year. And it's a book about living in a society with a lot of information. You know, relative to, say, the world in 1970 or 1980, we feel, many of us, you know, inundated, flooded by a tide of information. But we are not the first society in history to have experienced this quantitative uh, leap in the amount of information available. In antiquity, for instance, there was another time in which societies experienced this you know, uh, jump in the volume of information available. And much like today, society then was divided as to whether it was something bad, like Seneca, you know, argued, or something that had some positive components like Pliny the Elder argued. So we see the dystopic and the not so dystopic, more moderate views in antiquity as we see them today. The difference though, is that neither Seneca nor Pliny nor, you know, the citizens at the time uh, lived in a society in which 25 billion new smartphones were sold in the 20 years preceding 2019. Neither they lived at the time in which 4.5 billion people in the planet, more than 50% of the global population of 7.8 billion, were connected to at least one social media platform. That's at the beginning of the year. Probably it's, there is more now. And if we think that you know, as the studies have shown, those who are connected to platforms are connected on average to 6.6 .6 platforms. This means that people are ultra you know, connected to the world of social media. The number below, which is almost 100,000, is the number of entries that I found doing a very simple keyword search using the words Donald Trump on the site of CNN in October of last year type Donald Trump, hit enter, and I got almost 100,000 articles available at my disposal in a matter of seconds. It would have taken me growing up in Buenos Aires in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, many, many visits to the National Library of Argentina or the Library of Congress to retrieve a fraction of these articles about the then sitting US president or even the Argentine presidents at the time. 14,000 is the number of titles available on the Netflix catalog worldwide, right? In every different country, we have access to a smaller portion of that because of intellectual property rights. In the US, it's over 5,000. In Argentina, it's over 3,000. But many of these titles, 14,000, are serious. It's serialized fiction. Uh, which, as we know, have many different uh, seasons, and within each season, there are many different episodes. So if I wanted to do nothing but watch Netflix for the rest of my life, in addition to sleeping, eating, and drinking, I actually probably could not exhaust the catalog available on Netflix, which is the only one of the major streamers, as you know, um, Apple TV, Hulu, um, HBO Max, Amazon Prime, and so on and so forth. So we really, from the hardware standpoint, from the platforms, from news, entertainment, we are flooded, surrounded with information. And because it's not the first time that a society confronts this sudden leap in information, it's not surprising that the social and behavioral sciences have spent a significant amount of time trying to understand what this means. And the main concept with which they have approached this is this idea of information overload. And even though there are many papers about it, books even written about it, which different that address different aspects of the phenomenon, they all share a common understanding, common idea that there is an optimal, a sweet spot of information available to an individual person or a team or an organization to make the best decision that they can make given the circumstances that 
any unit of information after that has a negative consequence. Hence, it becomes the it begins the overload. Uh, phase and the more we add to that, the worse the consequences for society. Now, if this is a concept that has been used for decades um, by people, you know, all over, in particular the global north, by scholars all over the global north, why is it that I call my book abundance instead of overload? I call it abundance because I believe there are at least five limitations that the notion of overload presents to us to understand the experience of living in the world we live in as far as information goes. The first one is that the vast majority of the studies on information overload have had an instrumental you know, focus. They have essentially studied how people use information to make decisions, but most of us use information not only for that, but also to entertain ourselves, to learn about the world, to connect with other people, to express our views, to manage daily life. There are many more uses than just making decisions. And because the focus has been on these instrumental uses, the accounts have tended to look at the cognitive information processing dimension, in particular in work settings, where if you combine the cognitive focus and the placement in the world of work, then it, became, it, be, it becomes a little bit reasonable to assume this optimality in terms of the number of information. And therefore, that after you know, the optimal amount of information, everything else is negative, and therefore we enter into a stage of deficit. However, if we think that there are not only multiple uses of information, but when we are confronted with information, we not only process it cognitively, we interpret what it means, uh, it makes us feel stuff, we feel emotions, and we do it as part of larger practices of everyday life. And that is because we use information in multiple ways and in multiple settings, not only in the workplace, at home, at school, with our friends, having fun, voting, becoming members of the society we belong to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, it becomes you know, more difficult to make these claims about optimality. Is it optimum uh, that I watch the fifth season of Casa de Papel, Money Heist, my favorite Netflix show, within 24 hours that it came out, essentially binge watch. Um, was it a bad use of my time or was it a good use of my time? I sort of enjoy myself, so I would not imagine that there is anything wrong with that. But in other settings, it might have been if that you know, prevented me from doing some work that needed to be done or I disregarded my family as a result of that, it could have been. So whether something is good or bad in its consequences when it comes to the uses of information I propose in the book is something whose valuation emerges from the interaction between the content, the person, the setting, the use, right? And therefore we cannot assume this discourse of deficit. And the fifth limitation that I found in the literature on information overload when it comes to making sense of issues of abundance has to do that it was done, most of the studies are done from what is called the ethic perspective, the perspective from the analyst, from the outside of the setting, and usually adopting quantitative methods, mostly surveys and experiments. And I argue that if we really want to understand these multiple uses of information, how they you know, interface with issues of interpretation, affect and practice in multiple settings for multiple purposes, with different values, we need to complement these quantitative methods with, an, with you know, qualitative ethnographic methods from an emic perspective, placing ourselves in the eyes or in the position of the actors we are studying. So to address these issues of abundance, I have just one simple question that I ask in the book, and then I decompose this question into three parts. The question is, what is really the experience of living in this world of science fiction in which we found ourselves today, in which, for instance, I can communicate these ideas with you sitting in my office at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, the US, with FGV being in multiple locations in the country, DAPI in Rio de Janeiro, and the audience probably you know, all over uh, the country in Brazil and in other 
parts of the Lusophone world. Now, I try specifically uh, to answer this question by decomposing it into three parts. The first one is how do variations in micro level structural, macro level, sorry, structural factors such as socioeconomic status, education, gender, age, etc., affect the conditions of both? How we access to the technology through which we you know, encounter information and the, how we use the content that sort of we have at our disposal. The second question is that within these broad structural patterns, how do variations in meso level cultural dynamics, mostly in the routines that we enact uh, to deal with information and in the meanings we attribute to this information, how do these meso level cultural dynamics shape the experience uh, of information abundance in everyday life? And finally, what does this mean? What implications does this have? for media, for society, and for politics. I adopt in the book a four-part or four-prong approach. The first one is that contrary to most of the scholarship on information overload and most of the scholarship in communication and media studies that adopt what Jim Carrey called a transmission view of information where the key is to understand how bits and pieces of information move from person to person, from place to place, and how they are processed. I adopt the alternative, which is a ritual view of communication that centers on how people make meaning together out of the communication and out of the information they encounter. The second uh, part of my approach is that because I view information abundance as both a technological issue and a content issue, and something that has to do with news as much as it has to do with entertainment and with the social media content that is neither news nor entertainment, that is more the expressive and relational content. I combine scholarship on all these different subfields within the space of media and communication studies. In trying to answer my questions, I am mindful of the fact that it is important to integrate structure and culture rather than providing only a structural account or only a cultural account. And even though I focus on the contemporary scene and what this means for us today in the contemporary society, throughout the book, I adopt a historical lens to try to understand what might be unique about the current time, right? And what might be certainly a reenactment of responses that society had in different historical eras, as we saw from the opening slide with Seneca and Pliny. And finally, this is particularly important for those of us in the Global South, those of us South Americans or Africans, or in Southeast Asia or other parts of the Global South, most of the work on information overload, the vast, vast majority was done in countries of the Global North without truly an account of how the conditions of life in the global north, which is where 13, 14, 15% of the global population lives, so a minority, a relatively small minority of the world, how the conditions of life there impact right, uh, the findings. So I go to the global south and I remain mindful of how, as, I, as I'm going to elaborate in a minute, how you know, everyday life in the global south affects the findings what might be different and what actually might be shared within the global south and also with countries in the global north. The book draws from two main data sources. The primary source are 158 semi-structured interviews conducted in Buenos Aires in 2016 and 2017, and then an in-person survey that was conducted a third into the fieldwork in October 2016 with 700 people in Buenos Aires and the greater Buenos Aires area, which is seat of around 35 or so percent of the population. I contrasted findings from the survey with two surveys that the national government of Argentina did, the, the Ministry of Culture, about several of the same issues that I um, address or I ask in the survey. And the findings with not just with Buenos Aires and suburbs, but with the entirety of the country. And the findings are more or less similar. So I feel confident that the findings in the survey are also 
you know, representative uh, to a significant degree of what happens in other parts of the country. Now, why Argentina, in addition to the fact that I am Argentine, and, you know, even though I have been in the States for almost three decades, my heart is still uh, in Argentina, and I, uh, as Luisa said at the beginning, I direct the research center there together with Virginia Mitchelstein and do a lot of work educationally and research-wise uh, in South America. So there are three features of, Argent of Argentina that make it a particularly suitable context for this project. Number one, relative to high-income countries in the global north, a low-middle-income country like Argentina uh, which at the time of the study had over a third of its population below the level of poverty, and now it's probably close to 40%. It's a country with much greater material scarcity. So to access a, a smartphone is a significantly larger portion of disposable income for a sizable part of population, which means that it has to mean something really important to them. A connection to the world of digital information has to be something really important to them uh, to you know, spend money and time that way. And therefore, it gives us a cleaner and better look at what are the drivers of the connection to the world of information abundance. Second, a lot of the work done in the global north about the social implications of information abundance has to do with how it affects our social relations and the idea that, for instance, uh, you know, this world of information abundance is making us more lonely. But you know, the societies in the global north tend to have a much more individualistic and instrumental associational culture than the societies or some societies, at least like Argentina, in the global south. So it's interesting to address these issues of the, impl the social implications of information abundance in a different context and see if we get similar or different results and why. And finally, another uh, topic uh, of analysis, both scholarly analysis and media comment, uh, media analysis or media comment about the political effects of information abundance has to do with trust in institutions, institutions of democracy and in media in particular. The idea uh, recently that, you know, um, social media has really, uh, or information available on social media has really eroded trust in the media and therefore institutions and therefore damage significantly the democratic process. Now, these claims have been done mostly studying countries in the global north, which have higher historically and comparative higher levels of trust um, of you know uh, what happened relative to what happens in the global south in a country like Argentina, and we know at the same time that there is a global downward uh, trend towards trust in institutions. Uh, for instance, through the work of our colleagues at the Reuters Institute uh, at the University of Oxford. So since Argentina usually places in the bottom quartile or bottom third of the Reuters, for instance, measures of uh, trust in media and trust in news and journalism, what I argue in the book is that placing uh, the study there provides a little bit of an avant-garde to what might happen to nations in the global north if this trend, this downward trend towards media and uh, journalism and news continues. The book is structured into six uh, chapters. The first one is the opening chapter sets the stage. Then I have two chapters on what might be considered the technologies or the main technologies of information abundance. One, the sort of hardware screens, you know, mobile devices, computers, television sets. The second, the main sort of software of information abundance, social media platform. In particular, I look at five, the five most popular in Argentina at the time of the study, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Snapchat. Chapter four and five shift the focus from technology to kinds of content, in addition to the social media content that is explored in chapter three, and address news and entertainment. So I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so, and then I wrap up the book with a closing chapter that tries to bring everything uh, to a close and place with the opposite of abundance, with the, which is scarcity. So I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so giving you a little bit of an overview of chapter four on news, which I thought, given the work uh, of uh, DAP, would be particularly uh, relevant for this audience. Feel free to ask any questions about any of the other chapters. But I wanted to focus on one to give you a little bit more of the flavor of the findings and the implications. So 
If we think about news consumption during the second half of the 20th century to sort of set the background against which life occurs today, there are three main findings from the literature that are particularly relevant um, for this study. Number one, the news consumption is highly routinized. Most people get the same outlets and consume them in the same fashion every day. Number two, the idea that there are very predictable and stable temporal and spatial patterns of news consumption. That is, that for instance, print newspapers are usually read in the morning at home. Radio is listened to in transportation to and from work, for instance, if you people drive. And uh, the, the, the television news are watched in the evening in the living room. Of course, there are variations, but you know, by and large, that's more or less how news consumption was structured from the 60s through the 90s. Um, sorry, I flipped uh, too soon. Um, the third um, uh, significant finding is that all of these uh, processes of news consumptions and consumption are highly integrated into the relational patterns of everyday life that envelop news consumption within broader household work and social routines. There are two underlying, but usually unstated assumptions that, that cut across this literature are particularly important for the analysis that will follow. The first one is this idea that information was something that had to be obtained. Somebody had to go and buy a print newspaper or subscribe to that. Somebody had to go and turn on the television set or the radio set. And those uh, you know, the information that, that resulted from that process of getting it was consumed through what I call primary routines, that when somebody was reading the newspaper, they were reading the newspaper, not doing that and many other things, uh, that when they were watching television news, that was the primary focus of attention. Now, within, you know, this very, very brief two-minute you know, summary of news consumption in traditional media from the 60s to the 90s. Let's see what's happening in Argentina contemporaneously. From the survey that we did in 2017, we found that the Argentine public is highly informed about current events. 97%, almost the entirety of the, of the representative sample was getting the news daily. And by and large, the dominant uh, you know, source of news is broadcast news, in particular television, with radio coming a distant second. And then there is a second cluster that is growing over time, but is nowhere near the level, in particular, of television, of digital media, with social media edging a little bit uh, news on websites. And then a third cluster that is more a remnant of the past than is on its way out, that is print news, newspapers, only 3% of the population in Buenos Aires and the greater Buenos Aires area says that that is their main source of news. Much like the research in the 20th century, we still find a high level of routinization right, in how people get the news. More than 70% of the respondents agreed with the sentence, I always consume the same media. But the media is not the same as the media that people consumed 30 years ago. And the volume of information in particular is not the same. Now we live in an information environment in which there is a ton of news that circulates rapidly. Whenever there is a breaking news story, websites you know, have it within seconds and on social media within fractions of a second. And most of the stuff that is out there is largely commoditized. That is, most of the news websites have the same content. And most of what you see on social media are tweets and retweets and posts and shares, et cetera, of the same small number of stories. So how is it that people deal with an environment like this? I argue in the book that there are five mechanisms, five cultural dynamics that mediate between, on the one hand, having a lot of information available in the information environment, and on the other hand, the reception experience, the consumption process. The first dynamic is what I call the enactment of derivative routines. Unlike the primary routines, that we used to have for traditional media. Now we consume news as a byproduct of doing something else that is derivative of something else. 
So for instance, when we ask Sandra, who's a psychotherapist, um, when was the last time that she learned about current events prior to the interview? She said that it was when she was doing household chores, working for a client, uh, waiting for a client um, in her home office. And that is a habitual, normal form of her to learn about current events. Norberto said that it is normally when he's cooking, when he's mowing the lawn, etc., he puts his headset and he listens to radio news, but he never sits down and listens to the radio as a primary activity. The same happens with social media. Juana, who's an undergraduate student, said that the last time that she had gotten the news prior to the interview was while she was walking to campus, right, to the cafeteria to grab a cup of coffee, she was looking at her Twitter on her phone and then found the news by a local uh, website. Now, she was not clearly walking to the cafeteria to get the news. She, she had a few seconds to kill, she did that. And if the same happens on Facebook, according to Luciana, she never goes on Facebook to learn about current events, but if she sees something, she reads it. This first mechanism is coupled with a very clear perception among the vast majority of interviewees that the news is not something that they need to obtain because the news is something that is ambient, that is surrounding us, right? News, as my colleague and dear friend, Omero Hilde Suniga says, is something that finds us, that we do not need to find. And because people perceive the news to be like this, then they develop a series of practices to take advantage of this fact. So Julian, who's a film producer, says that you know, with Facebook and Twitter, there is like a spillover theory of the news in which you eventually find out what's going on in the world just by virtue of being on social media. This also applies to traditional media, not just social media. Sandra, who's a clerical employee, says, you know, I have a habit. I almost do not watch television, but it is always on and in a news channel. The same as Lucas, who says that television is always in the background in the morning, more as a waste of energy, which is a lifelong habit, than something that I really pay attention to. So we switch from primary routines to derivative routines and from uh, information that needs to be obtained to information that is clearly seen as part of the ambience. The third mechanism has to do with the quality of the information. People, the vast, vast, vast majority believe that the news that they get is biased by definition. It is that it's not biased as an exception, bias is the norm in the news that they get. So in the survey, we ask people to rate their level of agreement with the following statement. The news media of my country report the news independently of political powers. Two and a half times more people disagree than agree with this. Later on in the survey, we changed the word political for economic and we got the same results. So very, very robust results. So it's not surprising then that Carlos, who's a computer programmer, says that none of the Argentine newspapers, which as you know, newspapers tend to be at the peak, at the top of the quality, supposedly, and the independence and objectivity of journalists, um, much more so than you know, television or radio. So Carlos says, none of the Argentine newspapers seem to me objective enough to trust in the news. They mix news and opinion. And I do not take ownership of the fact, and they do not, sorry, take ownership of the fact that they are biased. Now, because I had such a large sample of interviewees, I had the good fortune of having a dozen or so people who had had you know, encounters with events that became reported in the news. So I asked them, or we asked them, you know, um, whether they thought the reporting represented what they had seen. And in all cases, they said no, right? And so Carla, who's a graphic designer in a small town uh, in the province of Santa Fe um, in, in Argentina says, and this makes you think, what bastards? I mean, that's not the, the, the insult that she used, but I sort of uh, made it a little bit more polite for the audience. What bastards? 
because they were saying a bunch of wrong things. And it makes you feel really badly, you know? You know, it's not what they say. You have the true information. And I swear to you that I read a bunch of web pages of radio stations, and it's all different. It's all wrong. So if this happens in my small town, I imagine that at the greater scale, it's all super manipulated. Therefore, it is not surprising that people enact a series of practices and rituals to manage what they perceive to be new studies, systemic bias, systemically biased. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. The fourth uh, cultural mechanism is the presence of a predominantly negative affect. Remember at the beginning that I said that I was interested not only in what people think, their interpretations, what they do, but also how they feel. And when they encounter news, by and large, it makes them feel horribly. Today, I read on Facebook a Todo Noticias story. Todo Noticias is a very popular uh, cable television news that somebody had found a newborn within a garbage bag, says Sophia. Why? What is the need to publish that story? They are all bad news. There isn't a single good one. It's pure angst. Agustina, who's a student, feels the same. I get very sad when I watch the news. I feel like you can't do anything about it, and it's all bad. And therefore, people like Marta, who's a domestic worker, says there is so much news that makes you feel badly that you prefer not to see them. And therefore, it's not surprising that the fifth and final cultural mechanism is the absence of attachment. By this, I mean people are highly attached to their, smart, their smartphones, their mobile devices. They cannot really part ways with them. It's very, very hard to do that. Same with social media. We are constantly going on our social media platforms and checking that. And even for entertainment, there is a rising practice of binge watching, right? Where, like myself, when there is a new show that has or, or a show, new show that I like, like Lately, Ted Lasso, highly recommend if you can watch it. Um, or, you know, a new season of a show that I really like, like the Spanish, uh, you know, caper uh, show Casa de Papel, Money Heist in English. Um, I, I get glued to that and I watch as soon as I can, as many episodes as I can. None of this happens with the news. So in a sense, we have arrived at the situation in which the news is everywhere, but experientially, in terms of what it means to people, its value has decreased dramatically. So why? In order to fully understand and answer this question, we need to contrast, to juxtapose what happens to news with what happens with entertainment. So in the book, I. Um, you know, take the liberty of borrowing from Adam Smith's classic, uh, The Wealth of Nations, and contrast what I call the poverty of facts with the wealth of fiction. So I don't have time to go into the findings, the data for the chapter on entertainment, uh, the consumption of fictions, but just to give you an idea, unlike the case of news, the routines that are enacted continue being primary, um, especially for the entertainment that people really care about. So even when people do double screening, say they are on WhatsApp with their group of friends commenting, you know, their new show, Game of Thrones, whatever that they are watching, they are still primarily focused on the content that it is on the screen. Much like the case of uh, Fox, there is a perception that you know, it's a ton of content, fictional content that people uh, can access. The affect, though, is markedly different, even for the people who are devotees of the horror genre, which is, again, as you know, highly popular these days, in particular in film, and it makes them cringe and gives them nightmares, etc. They still love it. They talk about the consumption of uh, horror films uh, and, and the like with a, an incredible level of joy. There is, of course, no distrust because uh, fiction doesn't pretend uh, to represent a reality accurately. And there is, as I said before, a high level of attachment. So where does this all leave us when it comes to understanding why it has happened, what has happened, this devaluation in the case of news and 
significant revaluation in the case of fiction or entertainment. A couple of possible alternative explanations that I want to rule out. The first one, the most simple one, is that what has happened in the news is a direct consequence and therefore inevitable consequence of the increase in volume because we have so much more. Every unit is the value, so the economic explanation. That would be fine if it also applied to entertainment, where there is a whole lot more entertainment than what I used to watch growing up in a black and white TV where I had four national channels available. So it's certainly not applicable in this case for news either. Then you have the technological explanation that because of the affordances um, of uh, you know, news production, um, we have a you know, decrease in the experiential value. That's not true. I mean, the technology for reporting, processing, and making available the news is, has probably never been better in terms of data journalism, multimedia journalism, community engagement, et cetera. And the same with content. At the high end, the reporting, the investigative reporting that we get today is probably the best in history. So it cannot be the economic explanation. It cannot be technological explanation. It cannot be truly the content, what is uh, behind this. What I argue in the book is that what is behind this is a series of cultural transformations in society, not necessarily centered in the media, but centered in how we live our lives, right? what we prioritize, the meanings that we attribute to information, what we value, what we don't, that we value much more information about the common person that we found on social media than what we found in the news, and the routines that we enact that do not really prioritize the news, but other kinds of information and other kinds of practices. And therefore, it requires to see what I call the folding of news consumption within the broader associational norms and practices that envelop right, how we get the news and who, how we learn about current affairs. So what does this mean for those of us who study and think about media and society? The first one is that in terms of the heuristics that we use, we really need to do, as Dave Morley suggested 15 years ago, a, we need to engage in a process of decentering the media, that we need to explain communication phenomena not from within the characteristics of communication, but looking at it from the outside, from how communication plays out within broader, much larger uh, patterns of everyday life. And in order to do that, we need to start bridging more studies of the different subfields within communication, media, political science, et cetera, to help counter the intellectual fragmentation that my compatriot and dear friend Silvio Weisberg so eloquently analyzed in communication a post-discipline. Now, all of this will lead us or invite us at least to rethink seminal concepts in the field that are premised on assumptions that perhaps are no longer valid. For instance, that the people experientially value the news and therefore agenda setting really works, or that journalism is essential to the functioning of democracy, which are much harder to maintain as ideas with a citizenry that has experientially devalued the news. It's not that they say that they devalue the news, it's that in their daily lives, what they do is they devalue them. And what this means is that it opens an opportunity for us to really think about this crisis in the appeal and the authority of the experts and institutions of modernity, such as journalism and the news media, but also medicine, as we are seeing with the case of misinformation in COVID, another of the central institutions of modern life. And I would like to close, this is my last slide, with asking if we really start taking seriously the crisis in the authority of the institutions of modernity, whether we are not moving from a media ecosystem that was anchored in organizations and professionals to a media ecosystem that is truly anchored in sources and audiences. Right. What we have here is, you know, people spending incredible amounts of time and their emotional energy on social media, pouring themselves out there and, you know, consuming endlessly, you know, the stories about the common other. But that is really a genre that was pioneered by reality television and the Kardashians probably being the most successful and most iconic example of that. And just, you know, one quick data point, the Kardashians have on social media much greater presence, just themselves, than the entirety of Condé Nast 
publications contain us is the most important print media conglomerate in the US, ranging from New Yorker, Vanity Fair, etc. The picture that you see on the right hand side of the screen alludes not so much to popular culture, to entertainment, but um, to news. It's a picture of my compatriot footballer Lionel Messi at his home the day after he announced his departure from Barcelona. He held a meeting with all his teammates. There were no members of the press. The only one person who was not a footballer there was Ibai Llanos uh, from Bilbao, Spain, a famous uh, streamer on Twitch, which have become a main platform for players to communicate with their audiences, right? So they are bypassing entirely the traditional media system and they are communicating directly either through their social media presence or through uh, people they relate to that have nothing to do with the traditional institutions of modernity and journalism. So is this the beginning of a media ecosystem ruled by sources and audiences and therefore the beginning of the end? for traditional journalism and traditional media organizations? With that question, I leave you and thank you very much for uh, uh, taking time to be here and look forward to comments and questions. Obrigada, Pablo. É, enfim, excelente a sua exposição. Acho que a gente tem muito para discutir. Vou passar para o Marco Rudiger agora fazer os seus comentários e depois tomamos perguntas. Bom, eu, eu queria começar, uh, enfim, agradecendo primeiramente assim a presença do professor Pablo, professor distinto professor da Northwestern, do departamento de estudos é, de comunicação e sobretudo um amigo nosso e com quem nós esperamos é, crescentemente vir a ter uma interlocução e, e trabalhos em comum. Então é uma honra para nós tê-lo aqui e ter a oportunidade de ver em primeira mão assim o seu livro. E, uh, eu, uh, eu, eu eu achei fascinante a forma como está sendo conduzido, porque me, me leva a uma reflexão é, sobre sobre o momento que a gente vive, e, e, e eu diria assim, o meu interesse mais, mais direto na própria discussão é, das estratégias de comunicação e da política, da construção da política e da democracia, nas nossas sociedades. A gente vê o fenômeno do Trump nos Estados Unidos, vê no, no Brasil aqui o presidente Bolsonaro e vê um discurso de ódio que permeia muitas redes. Né? E aí eu queria é, até enfim, tirar aqui essa distinção que é feita no seu, no seu livro, logo no início da, 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 da comunicação é, é, como uma transmissão e a comunicação como um ritual. E na questão do ritual, é, é, eu acho interessante que você traz que a ideia do ritual é de, de uma certa coesão social, de uma que você chama de fellowship. Eu acho que isso é muito interessante. No entanto, a gente não vive uma situação de fellowship na nossa sociedade. O que nós vivemos é uma, é uma sociedade extremamente polarizada e que há um, um distrust mesmo, uma falta de confiança nos fatos. E, curiosamente, isso que é mais é, é, é fascinante no, 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 no trabalho, e especificamente nesse capítulo, é o quanto que as pessoas acabam sendo muito mais seduzidas por narrativas é, românticas e ficcionais do que pelos dados em si. Os dados, é, a princípio, são mentirosos, as pessoas olham com desconfiança, mas as narrativas ficcionais elas conseguem engajar as pessoas e conseguem uma coisa muito mais importante, elas conseguem furar bolhas. Então, é, elas conseguem atravessar bolhas que têm visões de um mundo diferente, enquanto os dados são vistos com desconfiança por um, por uma, por um campo é, é, e, eventualmente, por um outro campo de forma diferenciada. Então, é, se a gente olhar para a democracia... Né, você acha que a democracia, a democracia carece de narrativas é, é, no estilo mais, não, não, que não, mais ficcional, não no sentido do, de, haver um, de haver dados falsos, mas da forma como ela é comunicada? Porque as pessoas 
em síntese, estão desconfiando crescentemente do sistema, do que o sistema entrega, da, de, da democracia em si, das instituições. É uma, uma desconfiança grande. Mas será que não, não é um problema de construção da narrativa de, desse nosso sistema para esse mundo hiperconectado? Essa é uma questão que, que me interessa muito, porque o que eu vejo é uma... É, é o, o discurso da desconfiança e do ódio servir à destruição da democracia e o discurso de construção da democracia e de valores não, não conseguir percolar, não conseguir penetrar mais na sociedade. Então, a forma como essa narrativa é construída no mundo de hoje tem favorecido muito aqueles que jogam contra as instituições. Né? E isso, para mim, é uma incógnita. Eu não sei explicar isso direito. E lendo o seu livro, eu vejo essa distinção e como as pessoas absorvem vários, por vários segmentos políticos, absorvem a ficção e se repudiam o dado. Como é que isso pode ser vencido? Como é que isso pode ter uma ponte que, 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 que os valores passam a ser mais transcendentes? Essa é a minha pergunta. Thank you, Marco. Would you like me to answer that? Now? Yes, very much. Yes. yes. No, thank you very much. That is a very important uh, issue that you address, and I'm glad uh, you do. Um, so, storytelling and narrative has always been part of electoral politics and has always been part of governance. During different historical periods in different countries and different parts of the world, we see the prevalence of certain kinds of narratives over others. During the Obama administration, the main trope was hope. And in, I'm talking in the US. Um, and therefore, the attempt to reach across. It was already highly divided and polarized society. Nonetheless, part of the appeal of Obama was, to quote from his book, the audacity of hope, right? Then the pendulum swing in the other direction. And the narrative of Trump was a narrative of hate and divisiveness. The idea that governance was not did not need the entirety of the society. The idea was to have more of mine rather than of the others. Trump, like Obama, were quite, ad quite adept at the craft of storytelling. One should not forget that Trump was a highly successful reality television personality. Hence, going back to the Kardashians. Right? I mean, and the influence of reality TV in everyday life. So democracy certainly demands, as you say, and it has always had, leaders have always had narratives to convey the main message of their policies. The question for a social scientist is try to explain why do narratives shift when they do? why in certain countries and not others, and what effects do these shifts have in the societies in which they operate. So divisiveness and polarization predated the ascent of Trump. Nonetheless, it is probably fair to say that Trump's narrative rhetoric of hate and divisiveness has exacerbated this. And even after he has left office, right, that continues to be the case in American society. I'm assuming um, in other parts of the world, there are effects. I cannot assume whether they are the same or they are different. In my home country for Argentina, there's also been significant um, you know, polarization in society and significant narratives of divisiveness coming from the highest level of office. And that has had, we see in the data loud and clear, that that has had a significant effect over the past, you know, X number of years and decades um, of 
making the population become more distrustful of the media institutions. And that becomes a, both a blessing and a curse. Um, it is a curse for the obvious reasons that it's very difficult to engage in a collective fellowship, as you say, in a collective project, if you are all the time, all the time distrusting what you get. It is a bit of a blessing because what our studies show is that the more distrustful the population, the more difficult it is to fool them. Once people become quite adept at distrust, they are quite good at detecting falsehoods. So that's the good part. Well, in the States, we call it the silver lining. But um, it does have some negative effects. It is important to, to say in the context of, and I do not want to talk about Brazilian politics, but for the little I know, because I'm not an expert, but in the context of what I know about South American and American politics in general in the past 20 years, a lot of this narrative uh, or narratives of divisiveness and hate tend to target the media as the enemy, news as the enemy, right? What you saw in my presentation when it comes to the idea that the news are systemically biased is in part a consequence of decades of targeting the media as the enemy rather than as a reporting agent on government and the public sector. Now, it is also true that the media organizations do have oftentimes their own set of interests, right? Um, but uh, that is, you know, in addition to or parallel of, I mean, so uh, this, as you have rightly identified, these uh, narratives uh, of hate, of divisiveness, etc., they do erode to a certain degree the collective cultural foundations of democratic processes. And unfortunately, what we know about culture is that it takes a long time to develop, but it also a long time to change. So even after these narratives may leave the stage, the, link, the effects will linger for quite some time. So it's important to keep that in mind as we think about the broader you know, implications of this for democracy and for you know, the societies in which we live. Deixa eu só complementar antes de passar para a Luísa. Você acha, então, que a política tem que se tornar cada vez mais uma narrativa épica ao invés de uma apresentação de fatos? Another excellent question. I do not see in the realm of politics, or shall we say strategic communication, as it's called these days, um, fact and fiction as mutually exclusive. No successful leader will be able to rally you know, their constituencies behind just with facts. If they don't all have any facts and they only have fictions, that will not work either. So that has always been the case. And it's very important to pay attention into that. And for those in the audience or who might see this afterwards who are in the more big data, computational, social science, artificial intelligence view of political communication, strategic communication, either as a politician or as an advisor or as a student or, or as a consultant, the answers will never be solely or purely based on data. You will never be able to find the right narrative, the best one, the best speech, et cetera, by crunching billions of data points. Because there is something about storytelling and the craft of storytelling that is completely irreducible to volume of data. And that is complementary. It's not mutually exclusive, it's not opposed, but it's complementary to, and that's why I, I have become a little bit concerned at the trend in my field and the trend in the academy, this complete fascination, which almost is a fetish sometimes with big data, artificial intelligence, computational, social science. You know, the world was there in 1950 and 1960 with cybernetics and general systems theory, and nothing really came out of that. We have greater computational power now, um, but that's, that's it. I mean, there are things that are completely irreducible. You cannot, not, not even Netflix can manufacture a hit crunching 
uh, their server data. And that's why they overinvest, and that's why they still have many flops, despite their best attempts. Not even Amazon Prime, Amazon Studios cannot do that. There are many flops. Uh, they are so, so they both go together. Uh, the best politicians and the best consultants and the best communications officers will probably have a bit of both. They, have, they will have a poet and they will have a computer scientist um, in their staff. É, obrigada. Eu vou aproveitar, na verdade, essa deixa que, que você deu para começar assim, o meu comentário e minhas perguntas, porque eu gostei muito do, né, do teu livro e de como tu conduziu a pesquisa e desse olhar né, para os pequenos dados, como, como tu mesmo fala no, no teu livro, e não só para o Big Data. Achei isso foi muito rico. E também gosto muito dessa abordagem de, de trabalhar conjuntamente com o entretenimento e a informação, né? Porque realmente, geralmente, a gente trata na comunicação como polos separados, né, como polos opostos. E juntando isso com, com essa questão, né, da abundância de informação, que eu acho que, que é uma questão, assim, é, né, de séculos, é sempre uma preocupação o quanto mais se produz, né, era uma preocupação com o começo da, da prensa, dos livros, etc., mas também, ao mesmo tempo, a gente está sempre produzindo mais. Nunca houve um momento em que realmente, agora vamos produzir menos, vamos ter menos informações, né? Então, acho que, que isso é uma questão que suscita muitas coisas. Eu fico pensando em, em três pontos específicos, assim, e são mais ou menos perguntas, mas você fica livre para abordá-los como, como quiser, assim. É, uma primeira questão é, que, que me ocorre é como, como que esses é, sujeitos é, navegam nessa abundância no sentido de produção de memória, seja memória coletiva ou memória individual. Se você chegou a conversar é, com seus entrevistados sobre as suas práticas, não só de consumo, mas de construção de memória, como que eles, como que eles né, navegam nisso no passado, e também, é, me, meio correlato a isso, uh, se ou, é, surgiu na, na sua pesquisa também essa relação com os, a, os sistemas de automação, né, de organização e hierarquização da informação. Agora, por exemplo, você estava mencionando a Netflix, e, e então como que a Netflix vai ordenar um determinado conjunto né, de, de audiovisual que possui para ofertar os seus né, a, a quem está assistindo, como que os sujeitos se, se relacionam com, é, com esses sistemas né, que, é o, que hierarquizam informações para eles. E outras é, duas questões é assim, eu fiquei pensando, é, de que maneira esse, esse contexto de abundância de informação que a gente tem vai influenciar na educação, né, nos processos educativos de crianças, de jovens, de formar novos profissionais? Que habilidades... É, são necessárias para navegar nesse contexto, essas habilidades são diferentes das habilidades anteriormente é, necessárias, né? Qual é a tua opinião sobre, sobre esse contexto de abundância e a relação com a educação? E terceiro é sobre o papel dos jornalistas e dos produtores de conteúdo, é, no sentido de do papel deles mesmo como é, produtores né, constantes de, de abundância. Uh, se você acha que haveria, um, ou não, né, ou se é um caminho ou não, ou se haveria uma tendência para é, processos in, inversos, né, por exemplo, temos o slow journalism, ou outras formas que tentam produzir menos de uma forma mais longa e não mais, ou se isso, na verdade, talvez vá na contramão do que são as práticas hoje, qual a sua opinião sobre? Excellent questions. Thank you so much, Luisa. I am going to uh, do one, three, and two. Um, the first one is that it wasn't a central topic of the book, but if I think about the, the interviews and the material in general, I would say that what, what we are seeing is a trend that has you know, existed for a long time, but it has deeply intensified to delegate memory to the information systems that are the heart, the heart, the core of abundance. So I don't know you, but I do not know any phone number other than mine. I really do not know any phone. I, I have all my phone numbers here. 
If I lose this and I need to call somebody, I do not know. As a matter of fact, I had that problem a few years ago. So now in my wallet, I carry a piece of paper with, an, with a series of numbers that I can call, right? But I, I used to know all the phone numbers of the people who are close to me, right? Because you had to dial now. So I believe a lot of that is happening now. It is not a negative trend. Uh, there are very interesting uh, philosophers of the mind, in particular Andy Clark at Sussex, um, that uh, have been advocating for about 20 years about what is called the theory of the extended mind, that these information devices should be seen as part of our minds. And therefore, we shouldn't try to memorize what we can store somewhere. Right. And with a couple of backup pieces of paper in a wallet or, you know, keychain or something like that. Um, but I think the world of information abundance is making our memory much greater, but at the same time, much more connected to technology, residing not only in our minds, but also in the devices with which we um, interact uh, as part of living in this world of information abundance. As far as what should journalists and content producers do, so um, another book that I have coming out this year, next month actually in the UK, and then um, in December in the US, is the Journalism Manifesto, uh, which is a polemic um, that we wrote with uh, my colleagues and friends, Barbie Zelizer and Chris Anderson at Penn and Leeds. And there we argue that in today's world, given where the audience is at, perhaps part of where journalism should be is not retrenching themselves in a distinction, professional, public, but becoming spokespeople for the public, becoming embedded in the communities about which and from which they should report, rather than insist in reifying this division. If you are naturally embedded in a community and reporting and reproducing the viewpoints of the community, that naturally reduces the volume of stories, right? And begins to breach this situation of distrust because people will see you as one of their own rather than an external agent that is essentially responding to the corporate interest of the organization that employs them. The third point is your second question, which is the most fascinating to me. And I think it's, it's perhaps of particular relevance to you as you are uh, about to launch a new school um, in the third decade of the 21st century. As somebody, so you know, I, I started doing research on the digital world in 1994, 1992 really, but uh, mostly 1994. And since 1996, I have been following the transformation of the press, journalism, news, media, etc. Um, for many years, it was the only topic that I looked at. My hunch is that the world of higher education is now where the world of print newspapers was in 1997 and 1998. The pandemic, as a byproduct of the pandemic of the public health crisis, there has been an acceleration in the transition to the digital world that is probably tenfold, that these 18 months represent 18 years, right, or 15 years of what would have taken us to go there. And the transformation, the acceleration is not really technological, it's cultural. That before you know, the beginning of 2020, the idea that we would have this kind of interaction will be devalued, right? Will be seen uh, that's secondary to the real thing of face-to-face, -face, right? For a few months, it was the only thing we could do. For a year plus in many parts of the world, it's the only thing we could do. And we realize that it's not so bad after all, you know, that when you teach online, the learning outcomes are the same, if not better. That what you miss is the interactional, the social side, and the pleasure that we can derive from that. But at the same time, really, I mean, although, although I would love to be in Rio de Janeiro now, you know, last time I was there, Marco and Amaro took me to an Italian restaurant, and I can still savor 
uh, the food, in particular the tiramisu, um, it is much less tiring for me because you know I came on my bike that you see in the background here uh, to my office, so I have better connection than at home. And the content is, we have the same interaction content-wise that we'll be having there. You don't have, you know, the, there is no plane ticket that nobody needs to pay, no hotel, you know, I don't have jet lag um, and all of that. So, so we became more used to, we realized that the quality of the interaction as far as content goes is not much lower, that there are many costs socially and culturally, but there are many benefits in terms of daily life, et cetera. And I think that many of these practices are here to stay. And what happens when you do this is that your classroom is potentially composed of 7.8 billion people. And that is incredible. You are not limited to the people who can travel to Rio or to Sao Paulo or wherever you wanna teach. The world is your playground. So last year I launched a center for Latino media studies at Northwestern University. As part of the center, we have a weekly seminar, a webinar like this. Our operating budget, I'm not, um, I have no problem of sharing. Our operating budget is zero dollars. We have zero pesos for this, zero, okay? So we held, 30 webinars of one hour duration. We pay, we don't have money to pay an horarium, right? But we don't have any costs other than the infrastructure at Northwestern. We have attendees for 45, from 45 countries. Okay. Nobody had to fly to um, Chicago. The people attending from Northwestern was a small minority. Tomorrow we have our first seminar of the second year of the seminar series with Ingrid Bachmann from Pontificia Universidad Católica in Santiago. Ingrid is not flying here. She's just devoting one hour of her time to share her research with us. We had, as of this morning, 60 people registered, right? From the vast majority are from Africa and Asia, in, uh, other than the US, right? Um, so, and, and we had had people who are researchers. We have had high school students in Dominican Republic. We have had government officials in Nigeria in the past. We have, so, so what this means is that I, for instance, I plan to continue holding the seminar. Hopefully at one point the pandemic will no longer be a concern. I will never have the seminar in person. I will always have it virtually because the idea is to connect the world, right? So, newspapers failed because they thought that what they had to do was to take their core assets and put it in a different format. But the web changed everything in many ways, not everything, but lots of things. So it would be a mistake for those of us who are in education to think that when the pandemic is over, we'll go back. We won't go back. It would be full to go back. And it has, tremendous possibilities in terms of reducing inequality. There are very few people who can fly or travel or live in certain parts of the world, but there are many more people who have connectivity. And because there are many more people who have connectivity, you know, there are many more potential students. If there are many more potential students who are not taking physical space, et cetera, et cetera, for the education that is privatized, you need to charge much less. And therefore it becomes much more accessible to many more people in the world really uh, you know language becomes the main barrier but again it can be overcome i'm speaking in english you are listening to it in portuguese right um you've been kind enough to devote the resources for this can, perhaps there might be a business model or situation in which the same could be done for other purposes so so i think we are um at a point in which we really need to rethink what the university, what the high school means, what elementary school means, and understand that, you know, the curriculum that we have in the classroom in the university, or even the curriculum in the high school that my younger daughter goes to in the elementary school, that curriculum competes with the curriculum that it already exists on TikTok or on YouTube 
or on not to go to edX and you know Khan Academy, etc. It's already there. We can pretend that it doesn't exist and treat our classrooms as if that was the case. But really, we are, I think, at the cusp of an incredible transformation in the world of education, in particular higher education, which is much less grounded in space than elementary education, and where the socialization needs of a 25-year-old are much lower from the educational setting than the socialization needs of a five-year-old. Right, which goes to kindergarten mostly to socialize and to learn content. So I think you, you are going to launch this incredible school for communication, have an opportunity to rethink really from the ground up what education can consist of if we think about it digital first, even when we have physical premises. Right. Um, so I, I just to, to wrap up this long answer, I, as, as you said before, I am the director of a master's program, of essentially uh, creative uh, you know, leadership in creative enterprises. I had my first class of the year here. We are open for business at the university. There are a number of students who cannot attend for reasons that are justified. So I teach the class at the same time in person and on Zoom. And everybody was in the classroom with the computers open. And everybody participated in the chat and everybody spoke, right? It requires a bit more effort, in particular when you're wearing a mask, but it can be done and it's a much richer interaction. You do not need to wait for people to take turns to speak. People speak in the chat room in parallel. You can do polls, you can do many things. So the world of information abundance, I, I think is a world of tremendous possibilities for education and tremendous possibilities for reducing inequality. Not everybody will be able to be in an urban center. Not everybody will be able to stop work and take one hour to go to university and then one hour back. And if we can reach all of those people, then that would make uh, a much more diverse and, and broad set of students in the classroom. Obrigada, Pablo, pelas respostas. Eu, eu concordo contigo, eu acho que, que estamos num cenário de muita mudança assim, para a educação. Eu teria muitos mais perguntas e comentários, mas eu vou ser generosa e deixar aqui uma pergunta que veio da, do pessoal que está nos assistindo. A pergunta é do Tiago. Ele é estudante de doutorado uh, de comunicação na Univers Universidade Federal de Santa Maria, uh, no sul do Brasil, e ele está pesquisando na sua tese o fenômeno do digital detox, detox digital. Uh, que são né, o fenômeno das pessoas que querem deliberadamente se desconectar. Na pesquisa dele, ele disse que encontrou que uh, muitos sujeitos dizem que estão cansados das telas e estão cansados das notícias e até das fake news. Uh, ele queria saber se você acha que o contexto de abundância de notícias é um motivador para as pessoas quererem sair das redes sociais ou do, da, do digital como um todo? That's an excellent question, Tiago, and it's a fascinating topic. As a matter of fact, one of my doctoral students here at Northwestern and, and frequent collaborator, Mora Matassi, is also working uh, on this, uh, on what she calls digital well-being. So I highly uh, encourage you to, to, to reach out to her as well, who's more of an expert than me on this topic. What I saw in the interviews, what I heard that are said in the interviews, and what I write about a lot in the book is that, yes, people do want to detox and they say they want to disconnect, etc. It is much easier to disconnect from certain kinds of content, like news or this or that, than to disconnect from the digital altogether, because disconnecting from the digital altogether is disconnecting from life. There was one interviewee who said that you know, she tried to quit Facebook and she did so for about three months and she went back to it. And so when we asked why, she said, well, because you know, I was missing all the parties, everything, because people were communicating about what, what they were gonna do on Facebook. They were not talking face to face. So we can put limits to WhatsApp, like I, you know, put my, my phone on sleep mode at night so only my, my family can wake me up uh, if, they, you know, if there is an emergency or things of that nature. But I think it has become increasingly difficult to detox fully. You can lower, 
right? You can, you know, the level of exposure, you can say, I'm not gonna check this platform anymore. I only go on Twitter once a day, you, you know, whichever, but it is very, very difficult um, to disconnect fully, to detox fully, because digital is where life is by a significant portion of the population. So even if you don't want to relate to that, the people who you relate to who are in the digital space, then you know will still be there and you will no longer be able to access them and what happens there. But it is a it is a fascinating topic and I look forward to reading the results of your of your study. Obrigada, Pablo. É, mais uma pergunta é, de um nosso colega pesquisador, o Eurico. Ele pergunta como que o contexto de mais comunicação mobile e mais conexão e essa perspectiva de um always on, né, de um sempre conectado, influencia no consumo de informação, mas também na produção de informação pelos... É, informação produzida pelos usuários, né, adicionando aí mais uma, uma camada. Yes, no, that's that's very important. It's very important in the book. The bulk of the abundance is not information produced by, you know, organizations or experts. It's the information that we all contribute on social media messaging apps. And that's the main revolution. We always contribute in one way or the other to, you know, talked on the phones and letters, wrote diaries, but it has exponentially grown. And it is a significant cultural transformation as much as it is a technological transformation in the sense that, you know, there is a, a brilliant historian at Harvard, Anne Blair, who wrote probably the, the, the defining book about information abundance in the early modern ages and in the Renaissance. And what she argues is that the transformation then was not so much a transformation having to do with the printing press as a main technological invention. It was a cultural transformation that, you know, that indicated that people, in her words, had a lust for information about the natural world. They really wanted to know in the 13th, 14th, 15th century about the natural world. And so the production of more texts, right, uh, first handwritten and then printed, catered to that information lust. The information that we last nowadays is less by you know, experts and about the natural, physical, or political world. It's more about information about the common person. And if you think about your current president and my for immediate former president, that's a little bit how they pitched themselves, that they are like common people. And that's part of their appeal. And that is the appeal of the platforms, and that is the appeal of reality TV. The nexus between reality TV and social media is highly, highly understudied. There are a few pieces that have addressed it, but reality TV really prepared the cultural sensibility for what then became you know, the massive outpouring of information about the most mundane. Who would have thought that a picture of my lunch would be worth my posting it to my friends. I would have been embarrassed 20 years ago to take a picture of my lunch and put it for the public to see. Think about it, right? I mean, it's ridiculous. My lunch, who cares about my lunch? Most of the time, I don't even care about my lunch. I just eat it, right? So, so but that, that is a cultural transformation. It has nothing to do with technology. It has to do with a society that has collectively, as a fellowship, decided that they're gonna value the communication about the most mundane right, uh, aspects of everyday life. Excelente, Pablo. É, eu acho que, que a questão, talvez, que fica muito clara assim, da sua pesquisa e de toda a tua fala é esse, essa relação né, das práticas culturais com as mídias e como a alteração das práticas culturais não se muda só porque a gente tem novas tecnologias, né? Ou, enfim, que, que, que é justamente uma conexão, assim. É, infelizmente, a gente está 
chegando no nosso horário. Eu queria te agradecer imensamente, Pablo, por estar aqui conosco, por compartilhar tanto, né? Foi, para mim, pelo menos, um prazer imenso e uma tarde incrível de troca de ideias. E esperamos poder continuar contigo né, o diálogo, sempre. Queria agradecer também ao Marco Rudiger por estar aqui, pelos comentários e pelas perguntas. E também a né, todo mundo que esteve nos ouvindo, que vai ainda nos ouvir no YouTube. Enfim, acho que esse, esse tópico, ele... Né? Não, não se esgota, ele só se, se prolifera com as, as próprias informações. Então, sempre muito bom poder discutir. Obrigada e boa tarde a todos. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Amaro. Thank you, Luisa. Thank you, all the team at FERTV. And I hope uh, to continue the conversation too. And thank you, the audience, for staying with us until the end. Thank you so much, Pablo. Obrigado. Ha, ha, ha.